a iniciar la emisión en directo vía YouTube. Perfecto. Buenos días a todas y todos, eh, mi nombre es Sebastián Valenzuela Valdivia, soy el encargado del programa de debate y pensamiento, y tengo el agrado de presentar este encuentro entre las curadoras de la exposición de Rojo y el artista visual David Bachelor. Eh, este encuentro será traducido simultáneamente por Jorge Rodríguez. Para utilizar esta herramienta de Zoom, abajo en el menú principal podrán encontrar un icono de un globo terráqueo que dice Interpretación. Ahí pueden ustedes seleccionar el idioma en el cual quieren escuchar, si es español o en inglés. Les reiteramos nuevamente que es ideal que tengan la cámara apagada y sí o sí silenciado el micrófono. Eh, vamos a dejar un espacio al final del de encuentro para realizar preguntas, pero durante todo el momento pueden realizar comentarios y preguntas a través del chat, las que se van a ir eh, recopilando para después ser leídas por las curadoras. Las dejo con mis compañeras, Carol Yasky y Daniela Berger, curadoras de Rojo. Muchas gracias. Gracias, Sebastián. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, we are very happy to have you with us and to have David Batchelor, especially our <laughs> invited guest to this red conversation. Daniela Berger, uh, my co uh, ¿cómo se dice? Oh, uh, colleague no? <laughs> in the museum. Uh, and co-curator of this exhibition. And we are very happy to have you here. A brief presentation about David for those who do not know him. Uh, he's an artist uh, and writer based in London with studies in fine art at Trent Polytechnic, Nottingham and cultural theory at Birmingham University. For 30 years, he has been concerned with the experience of color within a modern urban environment and with his historical conceptions of color within Western culture. His work comprises sculpture, installation, drawing, painting, photography, and animation. He has exhibited widely in the UK, continental Europe, the Americas, more recently, the Middle East and Asia. Bachelor has also written a number of books and essays on color theory, including Chromophobia in the year 2000, Um, published by Reaction Books that is now available in 10 languages. And this book on color and the fear of color in the West, which is so interesting uh, and has been so inspiring for us uh, for this exhibition. Um, well, I have to say that Bachelor David came to Santiago to Chile in 2005 Uh, for a selection of the um, uh, Sao Paulo Biennial in the Museum of Contemporary Art and had the pleasure to work with him at that moment. And uh, it was a very interesting uh, experience and surely we can talk about that also. Uh, Daniela? Yeah, um, just to add to Carol's brief presentation of David, we are honored and very happy that finally, after almost, I don't know, two years <laughs> of chasing for David, we were meeting um, here today, uh, at least virtually, and I'm very happy. I had the chance to be his um, student at the Royal College of Art a number of years ago already, and um, I will never forget his teachings, not only about art and color, but also about writing. Um, he's, a, he's an amazing writer, so I super recommend his Chromophobia book and, and other um, research he has, has published. So welcome, David, and thank you so much for joining us today. Let me just very briefly say thank you, Carol and Daniela. Um, it's, 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 that's a lovely um, 
Um, lovely introduction and slightly embarrassing. But. <laughs> As always, uh, they always are, aren't they? Okay, so as a brief intro introduction to the exhibition, uh, we will share with you uh, a video um, that we can comment on later. This, this is a bit like a TV show, so it's a bit embarrassing also for us, David. So we're going to share, yeah, you need to explain what you're going to do next. It's kind of funny. Okay, remember to silence our microphones. Yeah. Here. Este caso quiere decir la pasado, una fuerza que pueda despertar, cambiar la vida. Hopefully, yeah, with, with the technical difficulties, you all got to see at least the main idea of the video. It was it was 
very visual, needless to say. So um, I think you got it. The video is on our website. If you, um, yeah, Maria Jose Vilches just posted the link to our chat in case you're interested in watching it again. With the audio, if you didn't hear it, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And it was Isi Marras, the author, it's important to, to say. So um, as a brief introduction um, to this conversation, I would like to say that uh, read this exhibition uh, is an, uh, a collection exhibition, a collection of the Museum of Solidaridad Salvador Allende that was founded in 1971 uh, within this uh, commitment of the artists to what was happening in Chile uh, with the Unidad Popular and Salvador Allende's government first. Afterwards, all the resistance during um, dictatorship and the exile of all the founders of the museum and how it continued to receive donations from the artists to support resistance. Um, and then the museum came back to Chile in 1990 and this year we are celebrating our 50th anniversary since the first exhibition. Uh, so all the works that you saw in the video are donations from artists from all over the world to Chile, to the people mm -hmm. of Chile. That is very important when we thought about uh, this exhibition and why call it red. Um, Yes, I think as, as Carl was saying, the history of both the museum and the country, it's very strong. And I think at some point it can, or it, it is, uh, it may be a burden in, in, in the best sense of it. So we wanted to take a challenge that was to look at our big collection. The collection comprises today approximately 2,700 works. We wanted to look to our collection and look at it from a point of view um, of the arts, basically, of, a, of an element of art as important as color, not history, not the periods of donations that we divide in three, meaning uh, solidarity, resistance till 90, and then democracy, but color, a, a standpoint, a, a very relevant part from from the artistic uh, point of view. And within color, <laughs> we took the challenge for many reasons um, to explore, uh, well, the, the red one, just the, the importance, the strong, the rebel, the difficult, the amazing, the lovely color red, that is very part of our, of our history as well. Um, and what you're seeing here as a background is um, a constellation of works. We, we didn't want a logical order to be followed whatsoever. And what we did with Carol was to think and to feel about color in three main aspects. We divided the works in constellations that follow the idea of ideology, of chroma, the color sort of by itself or in its power, in its energy, and the idea of body, which we found very present in um, the collection works. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, and in that sense, uh, the bio bibliography we, we looked at and read with Daniela, of course, amongst those books was chromophone, chromophobia and this falling into color that was very attractive for us and to look at our collection from that perspective, but not only for us, <laughs> but also mm -hmm. to connect our audiences to the collection. That is something very important. Um, since it is so like um, uh, ideologically, um, um, yeah, related. politically committed, yeah. Yes, uh, people in Chile uh, hear about the museum and many, and many of them do not know we have an art collection. They think we have a collection more, more related to archives um, about the period of Salvador Allende. And so uh, that is something that we always have to deal about. 
And uh, this exhibition was thought with all the uh, different areas of the museum, different, different departments. Public program was a great uh, part of this exhibition in thinking how to connect uh, these works uh, with the public and um, the, the, um, how we, um, you saw in the video, for example, uh, the light uh, that we used and certain elements um, that, that challenge the people uh, no, to connect with the works and what is read for them. Uh, and that is something very special that color has, the possibility to connect to these cultural ideas no, that have been uh, taught to us, but that also uh, we have a sentimental, like personal connections with colors. Mm -hmm. uh, Mm -hmm. We were looking to uh, have many different emotional reactions in the exhibition or within the exhibition, both collective and individual. We, uh, we saw and we're looking now at the works that presented, for example, many different variations. Uh, as you know, David, uh, a color can be very different. It can be very cultural as well. In, it variates in different cultures. So we were also very amazed on what, on what people were replying. We had um, sort of different stations of uh, interaction and action for the public, for the audiences. So they would leave messages, reactions with different colors. It was very, it, it, it has been, it's still on, uh, very interactive in that sense. Also one very important thing to mention is the experience room in the basement. We uh, and we think this this is likely to be a methodology that we continue to use in the future. We did a we all developed an experience room where not only public programs but also us, the curators, the director, our colleagues do conversations, um, dialogues, activities. We even had a couple of sessions of onces. We say in Spanish or tea where we share uh, food, red food, of course, very curated fruits, even <laughs> a bit of wine, let me say. And we share our ideas and thoughts and personal and collective reflections about color. So it's been, even during the pandemic that has been very challenging, it's been very um, sort of, uh, well, very active. Um, need needless to say that that is thanks to a great communications team, public program team, and all the museum that has been working collectively. This show um, challenged us also in terms of space. We used the whole building, the whole house. That's the experience room you're seeing right there. So you can see a beautiful work from Basarelli that explains without words that shows the power and the effect of color of the red color in the context of green of blue and and the variations right as as the Bauhaus uh, um, exemplary uh, showed us but also you can see the chairs and the tables and the workspaces and the reactions and the works of art that not only children but groups of different people of different ages left um, for us. So it's been a, it's been a colorful, challenging, um, and I, in my personal opinion, we've talked about this before, David, it's been also healing sometimes to be able to be in a space, in a, in a show that actually touches, right, your, your human condition rather than demanding you certain knowledge to, um, to make sense. Mm -hmm. And just a little explanation, this is the second floor, what you're seeing now, that we took off, we uh, uh, deinstalled a bit before the first floor, so the, so the second floor's life was shorter, and the second floor was more focused in the idea of body, as, as you see. So it posed questions as, for example, that, that I, of course, open up for the public to discuss later. When are we talking about color? Is it always has to be present there, literally, or is color an emotion, a, a reaction, a, a feeling? Um, what does red have to do with death, for example, in some cultures? 
What does red have to do with life, with creation, with paganism, with sexuality, with eritism? So a lot of this idea with nature um, and abstraction, the amazing um, body of works from Finland and from Sweden that are strong in our collection, post also these ideas. Um, so yeah, many, again, this is publicity, but the catalog is in our website in case you happen to be interested to looking at these works in detail. Yes, and, and I would like to add that uh, red has this uh, connotation of power, no? It, it's very important. Um, Antonio Diaz, we saw his um, flag, red flag at the beginning of the catalog that it's outside our museum. Um, like um, you can see this flag from far away in the street. And it was this idea of Antonio Diaz that this flag and red for itself has this power of changing, of renovating everything, no? And that force uh, also goes with binary quality contradictions of red. Uh, and Daniela was talking about death, but red also uh, has this power of uh, the blood that brings life, no? Uh, of how, uh, uh, birth and the body. And, uh, and so there are so many uh, connections that people can make with these works. Some of them you can see are very like uh, figurative and have narratives that have to do with our history. Uh, but there is a big group of works that are abstract. Uh, Mario Pedrosa, who was the, the main founder of the museum, a uh, Brazilian art critic, uh, had this uh, idea that abstract art was, had the capacity to connect people, the workers, the miners from the north of Chile with art, that it was very important to have uh, abstraction and modern art in the museum, as well as experimental art. So um, uh, this is reflected in our collection and uh, um, this exhibition permitted this mixture of, um, of works uh, within all these rooms, uh, thinking of this uh, three topics that Daniel explained before, um, like constellations, not, not very rigidly put it in the rooms. And uh, you can see there that red window, for example, it was this, um, ¿cómo se dice? Museográfico, gesto museográfico. Like it was a, yeah, an exhibition design gesture, very yeah. particular. Um, so, so the, the people um, looked at the works from different perspective. They were very like uh, surprised to see the, the, the street and the um, uh, landscape turn red in a moment when in Chile, uh, we were having the um, estallido social, this social unrest yeah. um, uh, two years ago, um, three. Um, and uh, so it connected with many um, emotions at that mm -hmm. moment as well. It was very interesting to see, yeah, for example, here, the dramatic piece of this Polish artist, Jonas Stern, that talked about uh, death and blood um, and, you know, bones and body. And at the same time, as Karol was saying, and with this idea, I finished to finally give the word to, to David. Um, yeah. The Chilean revolution was happening for me. It was happening right there in front of us. We were protesting, demonstrating every day. It was very dramatic in some cases. People were dying, being killed. So it also had an impact in the exhibition and how we as a team perceived it, but also I believe as how the audiences, the publics perceived it as well. So it became very, um, yeah, very it was a sort of a social reflection of a, of a particular moment. And well, that, that happens with art often, no? I mean, um, there, is some, there is a taste or a temperature of the moment that art sometimes captivates very uh, thoroughly, very lucidly. 
And I believe this window for some people was very shocking and poetic and very happy and, and celebratory for others. It was very particular. No need to say that we are an austere museum. Our ethical approach to our exhibitions is um, a one of uh, low budget. So our exhibition design was very thought with the team, with public programs, with, with everyone. And we collectively took these chances to highlight some uh, particular pieces that um, required it. And one last thing is that we collectively wrote also the um, uh, sort of the expanded texts of some works. This means uh, interns, people from the different teams of the museum and also people from the community and researchers and art historians were invited to put their voices, their own interpretations, connections and emotions within particular works. So if you see this text, for example, Paula Fernandez here, she was an intern of the collections area and she did um, an amazing research about this particular work and so she wrote the text. So red and color as well as a collective um, approach, as a collective practice, because it is individual at once, very particular and very personal, but uh, as well, it's a, it's a social um, experience. And if you agree, Carol, maybe we could sure. pass the honor to, to David and hear about his, yeah. his thoughts. People want to hear you, David. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank, thank you again. But I mean, I was actually very happy um, just to listen to you guys and just sit being, being the audience. I mean, not least because I, I've heard myself talk so many times, I'm kind of, <laughs> kind of done with it, but nevertheless. I and mean, my first thought is it's just I'm just my regret at not being able to come to Santiago again and to see the exhibition in, in the museum, which, of course, I've never seen the museum and, you know, and the vast majority of the works there. And of course, that was that was purely because of COVID uh, and it's you know, affected everyone's lives in one way or another. Um, that's a, I mean, that is a great shame for me because, as you said, I, you know, I first came to Chile in 2005 after I'd been in a... BNL in uh, in um, Sao Paulo, but before that, I, when I was a student, I taught refugees, um, Chilean refugees, after the coup, um, who learned, <laughs> allegedly I was teaching them English um, as a. <laughs> <laughs> um, in effect, I got the education because I learned so much about Chile and the, the recent politics of Chile and of Latin America more generally, and. So that, that was, you know, it was really in the late 1970s that I began this, you know, rather remote, um, but, but, you know, intriguing relationship with your country. Um, and then, of course, I was looking forward, you know, last year to, to, coming, to coming back again. However, um, I think the, the origins of the collection is, uh, is remarkable and very moving and very mm. much of its time. Um, and I, I would imagine it's unique as well. Um, mm -hmm. So again, that's another reason, irrespective of the, the red show, uh, why I'd be interested in seeing it. Um, but, you know, um, you, write, you, you invited me to, to be a part of your conversation because of red, because of the color. So I should, you know, I should uh, address myself to that. Um, I mean, you're, you're right, of course, that red is, red is a million different things to a million different people. Um, that's a sec effectively what Albers, uh, Joseph Albers said in his writing. But it's also, I think, I mean, it's literally true in the sense that the average human can distinguish between about uh, 10 million different gradations of color. I, I wrote about this in your, in your booklet. Um, so, um, but, but most, most languages only have about 11 basic color terms. So there's an enormous asymmetry between what we can see in the world and what we can say. And, and I think that's one reason there is often, uh, particularly in the West, a, a resistance to color because it's an embarrassment to language. And we, and we don't <laughs> want to be embarrassed by color in that way and by the senses more generally. Um, 
Um, so you know, if there are 10 million gradations of color that we can observe, but there are only 11 basic color terms, uh, this, this disparity means that for, if, as people often do, they ask me, you know, what's your favorite color? Every time I do a talk, every time, some, and I've ruined it now because some would, would but <laughs> someone says, what's your favorite color? And I have a very long answer to the question is my kind of revenge. But basically, <laughs> if I said, if I said my favorite color is red, really what I would be saying is that I have nearly a million favorite colors. And so you know, red is literally a million things, uh, a million perceived, perceptibly different experiences. So no wonder that you couldn't, that no one could make it meaningful as a single entity, it, because it isn't. Um, but we have this, this word in, in English, a three letter word in Spanish, a, four-letter word, a very simple word, to somehow contain this extraordinarily diverse experience. Um, so that's you know, by way of introduction, I would, why, why red is both so fascinating and so difficult, um, because all color has this very awkward relationship with language. Um, one thing I also mentioned in my text was that um, in the, there was a study in the 1960s <clears throat> about whether all languages had the same color terms um, and if they did, how they emerged and developed. It's a long argument, which I won't go into, but one suggestion was that not all languages have the 11 basic color terms that English and Spanish and most Indo-European languages have. Um, but, and some languages will only have two color terms and some will have three and so forth. This study suggested that if a language only has two color terms, it is always black and white. If a language has three color terms, it's always, they argued, black, white, and red. So in that sense, maybe red is arguably the first color insofar as it's the first color, it seems, to get, well, they sort of lexicalized, verbalized in language. So, and I also noticed that when philosophers talk about color, and they do, you know, well, some do, notably the great Wittgenstein, um, when they wanted to, to ask a question about color, they always use red. Um, you know, the, the, the philosophical statement, you know, imagine a red tomato on this. And I don't know why it's always red, but it is always red. Um, so, um, I mean, for me, I, I, I avoid in my work using color terms, principally because I, I want to work with color itself rather than our, the way we verbalize it or the way we organize it in language. Um, so to impose, to say, I, you know, I only work with red is to say, really, I work with language, not with color. Um, and no color has a fixed boundary. There's no secure boundary between what we say is red and what we say is orange, or what we say is red and what we say is purple. You know, these are territories that have soft borders. Um, and I would rather work in those without imposing those borders uh, on color um, to be able to work with as much color as, as, as possible. Um, I mean, do I use red? Yes, of course. In fact, I, I try to use as many colors as possible um, with one exception. The, I realize, that, you, know the, you know which one this is, Daniela. The, yes. Uh, I think the only color I don't use, I deliberately avoid is brown. Um, and I think you're right. <laughs> and it's because, well, there are a number of reasons. One is that 
there's too much brown in British art. You know, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's just, you can't avoid it. Uh, and the other is that brown is never bright. Yeah, I'm, I'm, inter I'm interested in, okay, you know, as you, as in your, Carol, in your introduction, you, know, you said I've worked with color for 30 years now, which is true. Um, but probably, but it's actually, my work is more narrow than that. Um, I really work with urban color. And that's, mm -hmm. you know, that's a very specific form of color experience. I, I don't really do nature in that respect. Uh, and so I'm particularly interested in the kinds of colors, bless you, that you um, will experience in the city, um, which often means artificial color, um, electrical color, you know, petrochemical mm. color. Um, and, and in many instances, you know, modern cities use illuminated color. Um, and of course, what you don't really get, illuminated brown, mm. it's not something you'd want to get too close to anyway. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm more interested in how color has developed uh, in, you know, in, in industrial and post-industrial cultures, uh, what kinds of colors you get, how they are um, produced, what materials and mediums um, you know, are used to support and, and present them, um, and how they've changed technologically um, yeah, and are constantly changing um, yeah, at, at the moment. Um, and there was one other thing I was going to say, and I've forgotten what it is. Oh, and also, yeah, where you find color in the city is particularly interesting. Color's not distributed evenly through the city. Um, when, when I used to work at the Royal College of Art, uh, when Daniela was obviously one of my greatest students um, of all time, um, that's, a, that's in a very, <laughs> that's in a very um, wealthy, um, um, borough. A borough of London, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and there's nothing interesting about it as a place to go each day. Um, in, and in particular, it has no interesting color. Um, mm. Everything's muted and the buildings are gray and the cars are gray and, you know, and the people are. Um, the park's okay though, the park's kind uh, of okay. You, you're right, the, the most, yeah. The bit I enjoyed most, Daniela, yeah. about teaching at the Royal College was walking across the park on the way yeah. home. <laughs> um, and with the parakeets that live there, um, which of course are not um, indigenous at all. So the more interesting colors to me in cities tend to be in the more you know, transitional areas or in the commercial areas, um, in the area of East London where I live, um, yeah, there's, there's a lots of vivid, um, improvised and more you know, formal colours around. Um, so, what else shall I say now? Do you want to, shall I briefly try to do this trick where I show you a bit of my studio? That would be, that would be amazing, I think. Okay, and meanwhile, no, no. Let, let me tell uh, our uh, audiences that they can um, write, uh, send us questions for you uh, in the chat as well, uh, at, so we can read it. Uh. And it, it can it's, write them in English or Spanish, because obviously um, mm -hmm. there'll be someone to translate for me. Um, I'm now going to do something technical, technologically very sophisticated, which is to switch from my... Um, computer to my iPad. Uh, I'm going to mute the computer now and then hopefully unmute the iPad. <laughs> now, I hope, hope you can see and see and see and see and see and see. There is a sound uh, reverberance. Can you hear me? Not, yes. yes. But yes. it sounds like you're speaking from heaven, which is quite interesting. <laughs> um, it has a little echo. 
it seems that I am still talking through the um, computer. I might do this silently. <laughs> that would literally be a meditation in color. Uh, that's easy, by the way. Well, hi, you see. <laughs> How's can you? How's the sound now? Better. Well, yes. Okay, I'm, I'm further from my computer. So this, this is the main part of my studio. I mean, in a way, I'm wanting to. What I'm wanting to show you is the sort of range of color that I'm working with. Um, this main wall mm -hmm. is a kind of mock-up for an exhibition I'm doing uh, later this year where I want, to, these are all works made during lockdown, incidentally. And what I was very keen to do was to put together works that were in a way very different from one another rather than a simple, in a way, a single variation on a the theme. So there's some long, very busy paintings, uh, some much more absorbent, mainly black work, some rather more, um, agitated um, smaller works, which is made with um, colored um, adhesive tape, uh, as you might be able to see there. Um, some rather, some sculptures in concrete, some asymmetric um, panels and some larger paintings and, and so on. This incidentally is my tape collection. This is probably my favorite wow. bit of the studio. <gasps> Just, just adhesive tapes. Look, there's some red ones, you see. <laughs> um, yes, I'm sure you organized that minutes ago. <laughs> just yeah. to show off. Yeah. Um, but I, I always like to keep a number of different things going in the studio at the same time. So there'll be sculptures, small sculptures and bigger ones. These are sculptures just made with the, um, the lids of the tins of paint that for years I'd been throwing away uh, before I realized that they were rather sort of perfect sculptural and color objects. Um, large, yeah, this is a lot of drawings, the work, that's a sort of workspace out the back for cutting and so forth. More sculptures, sculptures on shelves. Sorry, David, do you mind if I ask you a couple of questions while no, you're doing the do. tour? Yeah. Um, because I did a bit of research and I noticed that you're calling those works in the left landscapes. So I think it's, a, I think it's my first time to hear that a work of yours is playing with this sort of idea of um, nature with the abstract oh. use of color. Okay. How's, well, that, how's that going? <laughs> um, of course, we're not when I use the term landscape, I really only mean not portrait. Mm -hmm. um, which, yeah, okay. uh, <laughs> um, I just, I really only mean the orientation of the, um, of the panel, whether it's vertical or horizontal. Oh, um, okay. So I'm sorry, Daniela, but it's, it's not a landscape uh, in, in any other sense. In any um, other sense. Is that, uh, uh, in this Sorry, Carl, go ahead. Yes, I, I wanted to introduce a question that is in the chat from Felipe Carrion. And uh -huh. he's very thankful for uh, your words on color. And he would like to know um, the importance. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it happens. Someone just tried, someone just tried <laughs> phoning me. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, if, yeah. If those uh, works that are uh, small works, what importance do they have in in uh, as projects? Um, do you do you make them larger after? What is their importance or the size is that? Uh, yeah, um, it's a yeah, it's a good question. Um, actually, I'm going to go back to my computer now. I'm going to sit down and because it's difficult mm -hmm. to concentrate on answering questions sure. and walking at the same time. <laughs> so give me a moment. Okay. Thanks. Uh, 
Uh, how's that? There's still an echo at the back. Should be okay now. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, at the moment, I'm particularly interested in making works of very different sizes and scales. Um, and I, I like making things that big. Um, but at the same time, I like to then go against myself and make something you know, three meters tall. And I, and I kind of enjoy putting things of very different sizes and scales together. So most of these objects behind me are not maquettes. They're, they are their own things. Um, some of them, I'll think I, I could make that larger. Um, but mostly, um, I don't, I don't make sort of small versions of things that I can then scale up. So everything has its own scale, I think. I'm also quite, I'm wary of making, thinking if something works that big, it doesn't mean it's going to be much better when it's much bigger. Mm -hmm. Often- Definitely, yeah. When you scale things up, you lose what, what that thing was. Um, and things have to find their own size and scale. Uh, so I, I no. So I mean, there are a few things there which would be mac, might have been maquettes, but mostly no. It's it's all its own work, so to speak. Yeah. I um, meanwhile, Carol, we look at the questions. I just had a comment, David, or yeah, maybe a question also, because um i'm amazed by the contradiction when you say um the irrationality of color right so it's um it's a strength it's the energy of color what what appeals us in itself and it avoids language it uh, makes language embarrass itself but also in your work i find it to be very rational very organized as a sort of code of color as a sort of language of color. I mean, just looking at the background over there, I find that there's a logic to it that not necessarily is only organic or wild. Am I making sense? Do you know what I mean? Like um, it, this, I I really adore that. I, I think that's, that's so particular and so clever. And that probably has to do with your um, relation with urban color. I mean, what you said, explain it to me. Uh, um... I mean, it's certainly true that um, most of the forms I use, most of the shapes are both very simple um, and quite, you know, regular. The, you know, the, the circle, the rectangle or square, and most recently the triangle. Um, and I used to I used to worry about that, and it's a bit kind of Bauhaus too, you know. Um, but the first thing I would say was that, like in these, you know, in in these tin tops, the, the circles are broken, they're damaged. There's ed edges of paint, and it's they have a sort of they're not pure in a Platonic or even a Bauhaus. Mm -hmm. They're they're, they're of the world, uh, they're actual rather than ideal, and therefore they're not, the geometry is not pure. And mm -hmm. because I work with a lot of found objects, that is almost always the case. Um, so I prefer a damaged geometry uh, to a pure one. Um, but, That's a great title. Damaged <laughs> geometry. <laughs> um, and also, um, I, I wondered. I often wondered why I, you know, I, I got stuck with these shapes. And you know, there's sculptors I know who do brilliantly complex forms, which I'm entirely incapable of doing. Like, you know, most of my sculptures are, you know, flat. They're not. They're not really three dimensional. Um, and I think, though, I, when I when I have done more complex forms and shapes the first thing I notice is that it, it, it draws away from the color. And you know, if you, my aim as it is, is to make color that the, the, the focus and the center and the subject of the work 
then I don't want other things to get in the way. I mean, you have to have these other things, forms and shapes and materials, but I want them to be, you know, anyway, secondary. Um, and I, so that it's, there's either a good reason why I use simple forms, which is what I've just explained, or there's a bad reason, which is I'm no good at other types of... <laughs> <laughs> they both work though. Uh, yeah, um, but I, so again, I, I mean, so they, they, I mean, there is a logic to my work. I'm not sure that that makes the work logical. Um, I think, I, I hope there's a logic to what I've been doing over these years. Um, but in, in, at the same time, you're often, you know, the last person to see it because you're, you're too immersed in it. Mm -hmm. and there is a good question from Sylvia Feld that uh, asks you, uh, may small size be related to intimacy? To? Intimacy. Intimacy. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. I, I, again, I haven't thought of this. Um, I, I mean, I like, you know what? I remember when I was young, I, you, I would see these photographs of Henry Moore's studio. You know, Henry Moore's, the, you know, the, at least when I was a kid, was the, you know, this major, major figure of British art, the great modernist sculptor. And I always hated them. <laughs> I was not drawn to them, except when I saw photographs of his studio and there'd be dozens of little maquettes and models and little, just little bits of clay that he'd been working with. And I thought they were stunning and, and certainly more personal and more intimate mm. than the large scale public work. Um, I mean, also, I, I, with the exception of uh, Izzy, who's, you know, who, my studio manager who really works on the you know computer side of things i, I make all these things myself you know, I, I don't have a i don't have a regular studio assistant these days um and i like you know, i i like making things by myself because i think that's when you learn you know, and and particularly when things go a bit wrong um so a lot of what i do is i mean i think of things like this as almost like drawings really they're quick to make, they're quite improvised from what's around. And if they don't work, it's only, you've only lost an afternoon. And if they do work, you know, unalloyed joy. Yes, um, yeah, so I, I, I like that the smallness and intimacy, but at the same time, I feel the need to counterbalance it with large works, particularly when you leave the studio. You know, when you go to, when you, I did an exhibition in, in Edinburgh uh, just before in 2019, and it was mainly small scale works on shelves, like in this area of the studio. I remember and you mentioned it, yeah. I didn't think it worked very well. And I think because the museum, the, sorry, the gallery, commercial gallery was, a large volume, much larger volume of space than my studio and very clean and very clear. It made everything look a bit miniaturized. And mm. I, and I, I think I felt it needed something again to counterbalance that. So, you know, what works in the studio doesn't necessarily work outside the studio. Mm. Sure. Um, David, how have you coped with the pandemic? Because uh, hearing you, I um, believe that you, you explore the city to find objects, to find materials. Always like, like looking, you have like a certain eye to, to see something that can work for you, for your artwork. So, but, uh, yeah. Yeah, that that's, ab that's absolutely true. Um, the photographs I've been making for many years now, which are all found in the city, the found monochromes. Um, I'm going to give me a second. I'm going to show you another example. The, I mean, this is a small work. Uh, it's just glass embedded in concrete. I don't know if you can see it. It's, I, it's called. A, it's the first one I made. It's called a concreto um, <laughs> from the Brazilian, the Portuguese. Um, and you know, the, the, 
the inspiration for that came from when I was on holiday with my wife and we were in a, in a holiday town and one of the holiday homes had you know, broken glass embedded in the, in the wall around it, but they'd done it only in blue glass. And there was this kind of this extraordinarily <laughs> beautiful form of aggression. Um, yeah, exactly. Considered violence. And, and that just made me think. Oh, Another good title. There you go. Uh, it made me think, oh, maybe I could, maybe I could take that notion and you know, work on it in the studio. You know, glass in concrete. You know, it's, a, it's a great way of supporting color. So yes, um, it's absolutely true that I get a lot of you know, my ideas. And I think a lot of artists do from walking through the city. Well, I mean, one thing is that actually walking through the city was actually very easy during um, the pandemic because no one else was there and it was very quiet, very, very quiet and in some respects very beautiful. Um, but actually, I think I, that what I found during the, you know, in the last two years is I spent a lot of time in the studio um, uninterrupted by well, actually almost anyone but you guys. Um, the, 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 the no work was leaving the studio to come go to exhibitions, no work was coming back, teaching was either online or cancelled. So, yeah, I, and I, I found, and I think a lot of artists found, that it was an incredibly good period to concentrate. And I think I found the work I was making in the last two years got very much more studio based. Um, when anyway, largely a series of uh, abstract, fully abstract paintings and collages um, that I may not have made or may not have got immersed in in the same way had I been drawn away from the studio, mm. you know, to to either to London or, or you know to Santiago or mm. you know, no traveling mm. at all. No one did. Yeah, probably probably the one good aspect or side of the pandemic I can think of is the silence yeah. in every in every way, right? Um, in every level, <laughs> that I mean, that did help. I mean, we were very fortunate. You know, I, I live. Yeah, I can cycle to the studio. You know, um, I cycle anyway. Um, we don't have young children to school. Um, you know, we. So in all, in many respects, you know, the it was we were well, well positioned for the pandemic without knowing it. I also think that pretty much all artists have been preparing for this without knowing it for all their adult lives because you know, artists need solitude. You need mm. you need time and you need silence, or, mm. or that's certainly the lack of interruption. Mm. And. Um, you know, I, I feel very fortunate that it was um, that I do what I do because I have friends who are actors and musicians, you know, and, it was, and it's really difficult for them because they couldn't they couldn't yeah. continue their practice in the same way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's been it's been very tricky, very difficult for for artists practitioners. Um, may I uh, ask you a question of a Chilean from a Chilean artist? She's Angie Saiz. She will. Thanks you a lot for, for this talk. And it's great to see you after many years. And she says, how do you think political power currently uses color to influence us through massive manipulation strategies, such as fear campaigns, withholding information, etc.? Or many, or maybe can you think, think of an example where you've perceived color as a strong political influence? I'm sure think, Johnson has given you some chances. Uh, well, un unfortunately, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a very interesting question and I'm, which I'm not prepared for. But the, the thing that immediately comes to mind, unfortunately, is Donald Trump's hat. Oh, God. <laughs> the MAGA hat, um, which is unfortunately red. Um, that was the most obvious color symbol that I can think of uh, Recently, you know, actually, with the 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 parallel and opposite of that being black, the phrase "Black Lives Matter," of course, which maybe is the is the counter to that. Um, color and 
I mean, it is said, it is said that, um, what's it, I've forgotten our prime minister's name, uh, Boris Johnson. Maybe he's not prime minister anymore. <laughs> Maybe something um, we can, we can He is very particular. Well, it is said, and I, I, mean, I wrote about this notion in homophobia that he's said to be a colorful character. You know, and I wondered what that meant, particularly in politics, to talk about someone being colorful. Um, he I certainly it, likes parties, doesn't he? Yes. <laughs> no, I, actually, uh, that's really unfair, Daniela. That they were gatherings. They were they were work gatherings. You, oh, I mean, I'm sure. You, I mean, I don't know how many of you have been following the absurdities of, of British politics, but uh, it's really, you know, it's at its lowest ebb at the moment. I didn't think things could get any worse, but hey. Um, I'm glad at least in Chile you've had a good election result. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, we have these nominal colours in politics, red for the Labour Party, for the same traditions as you know, the, the Allende and um, the, the socialist and communist traditions, blue for conservatism. And you know, yeah, they use that, but and they, they increasingly they use nationalism as a tool, and so that's therefore the colours of the flag, the mm. Union Jack in our case, same colours as yours. Um, I find all of that you know, utterly dispiriting, um, and um, but I guess you know, if I mean, maybe the interesting thing is, yeah, what does it mean to call someone colourful in terms of you know, for Johnson and others? It's like oh, they're, they're en entertaining, maybe they're engaging, but they're unreliable. Uh, you know, you wouldn't trust someone who's a colorful. Mm. Mm. In a way, when I looked at this, when I was writing Chromophobia, I was more interested in what it said about color than about these people. But the opposite of the colorful character is the gray man in English. And I don't know if there's a Spanish equivalent and you know, the, the prime minister at the time when I was writing Chromophobia, I guess, no, it wasn't. Well, it, it had recently been John Major, uh, who was the conservative after Thatcher. And he was seen archetypally as the gray man. And there was a famous cartoon called Spitting Image, a puppet cartoon where you know, most people were wildly exaggerated physically. And the way they represented John Major was as someone who was completely gray. His eyes, his face, his hair, his clothes, and his voice somehow. Um, so you know, do I want my politicians to be colorful? No, pr probably not. Um, Carol, do you wanna do you wanna read Blanca's question? Is that I'm, actually, I'm just looking at some questions now. Can I say a quick hello to Rodrigo? Uh, Rodrigo Zamora, you helped me very much when, when we were looking for plastic containers to illuminate um, when I was in Santiago after Chile. Um, nice to see your name. Uh, I remember that work in Mac Quinta Normal. It was outstanding. It was. Yeah, I I, I, do, I donated the work to Mac, not least because yes. I couldn't carry it home. <laughs> <laughs> um, but they sent me some spare bottles that we could, that I then was able to make another version of it. Um, well, that means that work also came from what you were saying, Carol, from from wandering through the city. I it was mm. when I was in Sao Paulo that I walked past a building site. You know, and, and in Europe, you. Know, I mean, any building site you have, you know, fencing, and then you have red lights to mark it off. And but in Europe, you have these, you know, dedicated lighting systems, you know, which have got these particular, you know, luminescence, and they have to be made by a certain manufacturer, and it's all very organised. In São Paulo at the time, they 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 did the lights simply by getting a plastic bucket, hanging it upside down and putting a light little lamp uh, mm. in it. And you just got this beautiful glowing red plastic bucket. 
And it was, it was precisely that that made me think, ah, you know, could I take that idea home and, and work with it? And that, that then generated that body of work. And in, in Santiago, we managed to get these rather beautiful orange and green watering cans from a garden center. Again, all, all thanks to Rodrigo. <laughs> Yes, that chandelier that is now in, in the collection, Max collection. We have two questions to start ending our conversation, unfortunately, because of the hour. One is by Blanca Fernandez. It says, hi, David. I would like to know if you have observed recent changes in language or Western culture referring to digital color and our relationship with it. You mentioned before that it uh, it is impossible to establish limits for color names, but nowadays a lot of industries and artists work with color coding. And we are nowadays really used to see hyper stylized uh, color sets on screens. It's an interesting phenomenon, she says. Do you think it impacts our more natural instincts related to color? Yeah, I mean, again, it's a, it's, a, it's a very good observation. And I mean, certainly, um, you know, in terms of our experience of color, that, that's changed. I, I, the language, I'm not so sure, but the experience has because so much color we now see is through screens. Um, and that, that's very recent phenomenon. You know, it's, it's only 20 years since most computers have been had. You know, it used to say on them thousands of colors and then it said millions and now it says billions of colors. Um, I don't I think they're lying, but. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. How um, could you tell, anyway? How could you tell? Uh, so <laughs> we, we certainly see color, you know, color is presented to us in, again, constantly changing ways. And the, the colors of computer screens and so LED and um, RCD, I can't remember now. Um, so these different technologies have kind of, yeah, 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 yeah. affected it. Um, I'm not, I'm not sure if, I think we've got someone is, who could ideally be muted. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, that was the translator, I think. I see. Um, I think the, the color, the color, our, our language of color remains as inadequate as always, but that's a good thing. Um, but the, but the, yeah, the experience of color has certainly been changed by digital, digital technology very considerably. And there is uh, another question by, sorry, uh, Consuelo Levin that has to do with um, uh, to, 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 to them, uh, what you were saying about the materials found in the urban, you know, things we know and use. What's your opinion about an invented color as Vanta Black used by Kapoor? Uh, <laughs> and that is, all other artists cannot use or okay. nobody. Uh, yeah, that, I mean, this is, a, this is a good story which actually has generated one of the best jokes in art um, for many years. <laughs> so there's this, there's this extraordinary technology which is the brand name is Vanta Black. It's actually not, it's not a pigment. Uh, it's an it's a nanotechnology, and it's the most absorbent black um, that's available. And you can look it up on on YouTube, and it's extraordinary. If you have a you know a, a bust you know, of a head, you know in bronze, you can rotate it, and you can see all the different. If you if you coat it in vanta black, it just becomes like a shad a hole. You can't distinguish any um, elements within it. It's extraordinarily strange. Now this color was invented, or this pigment, this technology was invented for space research, uh, telescopes and, and military use. Um, now Anish Kapoor obviously has a interest in, in darkness and the void and so forth. Um, and he asked, I think, I, I'm guessing some of this, he asked if he could use it. Uh, but the company that own the, the technology, they're not gonna give it away. Um, so they, I think they said, yeah, but you know, you're not allowed to, they set certain constraints on his use of it. So I suspect that it wasn't um, Kapoor who 
established this exclusive mm. use. I suspect it was the company. I don't mm. know why I'm defending it particularly, but anyway. Um, <laughs> and also you can't just, you, you have to bake, bake it onto a surface at like, you know, a thousand degrees. It's not, it's not wow. easy to use. Mm -hmm. But there's this guy called Stuart Semple who got very angry about this. A lot of artists got, a lot of people got very agitated about this. Um, so he then invented a certain pink uh, and he said that anyone could use it except Danish Kapoor. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so you had to sign a little waiver saying, I, I am not Anish Kapoor. And I, <laughs> I mean, it was worth it for that. Um, but he's now gone on to develop um, a black pigment, which he says is almost as absorbent as Vanta Black. And I, I bought some, um, and it's not. <laughs> it's okay, but it's actually not much, it's not much more absorbent than the gouache that I use. Mm. And gouache is a very, very matte absorbent color. So um, also, you know, the problem with a new color like assembly, you, you have no idea how long it will last, yeah. what, what its yeah. longevity is. So it's, it would be risky to use it. Uh, in anything that you wanted to last for more than a few weeks. But yeah, the, the pink story is quite good. <laughs> and also he shows pink. I mean, <laughs> well, that's, that's, yeah, that's a good, I was just thinking about that. Yeah, <laughs> in a way pink is somehow seen as the opposite of black in this case. It's, it's seen as in a way the, lead, the most, perhaps the most trivial color. I mean, I, I, I use a lot of pink. I, I love it. Yeah, yeah, we can see in your background. Yeah. <laughs> and there also in yeah. the other side. <laughs> yeah. Um, Very well one. curated, by the way. Oh, it's just, it's, no, it's just, it's a backdrop I downloaded from Google. <laughs> um, I, mean, that, I mean, I suppose the other answer when, when people ask me what's my favorite color is, in a way, the serious answer is, well, what colors do I, do I go to in the studio most often? Which ones do I depend on most? And actually, you know, it is a kind of intense pink, an acid green, and a very, you know, very vivid uh, light yellow, I guess. But again, these, these are because they are kind of, they're very, art they have an artificial feel about them rather than a rich density of a natural color. So interesting. Um, when is your next exhibition? You mentioned it, and there is a question about it. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for asking. Yeah. Um, I'm doing a, I, in June this year, I'm, I'm going to be doing a, a survey show uh, at a museum in, <laughs> in England, in, in Warwickshire, otherwise known as the middle of nowhere, um, <laughs> called Compton Verney. It's a, you can Google it. It's, a, it's the most beautiful country house in Compton Warwick. Verney. Compton, okay. C-O-M-P. Compton, Compton yeah. Verney, um, V-E-R-N-E-Y. And they have a, they have a very beautiful um, exhibition space in, in, in a beautiful landscape. Um, so for the last year, I've really been working towards that. Um, and so you going, will be surrounded by nature? Yeah, it's a good point. Although I, I'll have to block out the windows. Um, <laughs> I'm not doing any work outside. Um, um, and that, I mean, it's very interesting for me because the earliest work in the exhibition will be, well, work I've never ever exhibited before from when I was a student in, in Birmingham and when I was making angry collages about Margaret Thatcher uh, in, in black and white. Wow. Um, so there's a lot, you know, there'll be work from the really very early 1980s through to the work I'd be making that I'm making, you know, today, um, and the effect of that is to make you kind of think retrospectively quite a lot. You, you know, and you look at your old work in relationship to your new work, and, and vice versa. It's impossible not to, and it's quite interesting because you notice you can notice these kind of links that you haven't planned or intended. You know, certain forms or shapes recur. Um, between work I was literally making 30 years ago and work I'm making now or more. And, you know, those things are one of the, you know, one of the 
concessions of getting older uh, the, the, um, is that you, you can see these shapes uh, that go over the years that you couldn't otherwise see. And, you know, it's, it, is, it is interesting. It's also, it's, you know, it's, it's complicated because, you know, there's going to be about 200 works in the show. So wow. just organizing it with, with Izzy is uh, time consuming. Uh, and the problem with that is it takes you away from making the work, you know. But, yes, but, uh, but I'm very happy about that. It's a, it's a very good experience, yeah, a very good opportunity. Great. Yeah, sure, I'm gonna, I'm gonna look at that definitely, at least from this side of the planet. Uh, you're all invited, by the way. <laughs> we might attend. Oh, I wish you would. Um, <laughs> yes, so Compton, Verney, Art Gallery and Park. Yes, someone who's... Yes, um, yes that's exactly right. Um, Great. That's Pamela, one of the best Chilean producers of oh, art. Great. Yeah, she's very quick. She is. So I think... Carol, we should we should wrap it up. Uh, yes. Unfortunately, due to the time, um, I think. How, I mean, how to finish this is almost painful. It's it's been so fun. Can we do it again? Uh, sure. <laughs> um, yeah, but next time, I'd like to do it in person. Yes. I was uh, I was about to say the museum. Hopefully, will be here at least for the next four years with this government. So. You're very <laughs> invited to come, David, whenever. Like, seriously, please come and, and see us and visit us whenever you come to this side of the planet. Uh, I mean, thank you. And thank and ser very seriously, thank you for inviting me because it, it's remote and it's strange, but it, but it is a way of being able to continue my, my relationship with, with Chile and with Santiago and, and with you good people. So it's, it's a real pleasure. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very and much. Thank you. For Thank everybody. You all, yes, all the yeah. audience have today, and uh, we will continue uh, our conversation afterwards. Definitely, definitely be in touch. So have a lovely rest of Wednesday. <laughs> yeah, I will. Thank you so much. Ciao. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you.